Welcome to part two of my watercolor painting series entitled How to Paint the Orange Hibiscus Flower. I'm working a mixture of ultramarine blue with Windsor yellow into the colors that I just applied and are still wet. Dropping in cerulean blue and into that Windsor yellow and allowing the colors to blend on their own some darker brush strokes of French ultramarine blue and Windsor yellow. I'm flowing cerulean blue into dampened paper. I place the cerulean blue where I see it on the leaf in the photo. Now I'm working in a light mixed green into the still wet cerulean blue. Now I'll get some of this beautiful color along the edge. Good. Yeah. It's getting time to buy another Series 7. Oh man, okay. Now these are just the first wash applications. I'm going to continue to work into them, as well as continue to work into all of this. The bud itself has a lot of cerulean highlights, so I'm going to float in cerulean as my base color. Into the blue wash, I'm brushing in a darker mixture of cobalt blue and Windsor yellow. Now I'm picking up some stronger and darker green color. Laying down some cerulean blue, then quickly working in my mixed green so they intermix. See how I like to work with variations on colors. So I have separate bins of variations on my green and I enter flow them to create a rich variety of color interactions. Going to leave it alone, let the colors spread and mix on their own. I've already applied a wash of cerulean blue to this leaf. Now I'm washing in a mixture of darker green that is a combination of ultramarine blue and Windsor yellow. I'm not blending the blue and the green into one another. I'm painting wet into wet and will permit them to mix on their own. Now I'm working in a darker green. I created the darker green by adding more ultramarine blue to my original mixture of ultramarine blue and Windsor yellow. Because I have a range of wonderful combinations of mixed greens, I'm working around the surface of the painting's foliage areas and applying the greens to wherever they are needed. All color combinations are applied wet into wet. Sometimes I pull the newly applied color down with a clean, damp brush. And I'm adding a touch of burnt sienna to the tip of the bud. I'm re-wetting this area to reactivate the paint. And into the reactivated paint, I flow additional plain water to push the pigment towards the dry part of the flower. A fine line suggesting a vein should form along the boundary between the wet and dry areas. Ultramarine blue and Windsor yellow makes a nice deep green. I'm going to drop some of that into here to maintain the continuity of the color surface. I'll also drop a little of that darker mixed green into this area and leave a small space to suggest a lighter vein. I'm going to tuck a little of this darker color over here to create the feeling that the leaf goes under the leaf over here. Ultramarine blue and Windsor yellow.
I'm using a light wash of the the French ultramarine blue and the Windsor yellow to continue on this side. And I'm going to allow some of that cerulean blue to poke through. I'm thinking that'll contribute to a wet look in this area. So I move back and forth from my lighter green to my darker greens. Cobalt and Windsor Yellow. Windsor Yellow with Ultramarine Blue for my darker. I'm applying darker greens over a lighter wash and I'm allowing the lighter wash to poke through in an effort to suggest veins. The lighter green wash was applied much earlier in the painting process and allowed to dry completely. Back and forth, lighter greens, darker greens. Trying to suggest the color variations that I see in the photo. Referring to the photograph of the flower, I carefully study the details of the leaf's surface and apply mixed greens to suggest the look of the leaf. The purpose of the original green wash that I allowed to dry was to establish a color that would work well for the vein details. And I continue to work in combinations of light and green washes throughout the leaf's surface, but I leave the areas where I intend the detail of the veins to be unpainted so the original light green wash shows through. Like you saw me just do in the previous leaf, I'll continue to paint into the foliage areas with my pre-mixed greens. And I'll do much of the painting off camera because this is the type of detail work that takes time to do. So don't rush it. Observe the source photograph carefully and by applying watercolor to create transitions from light to dark, paraphrase the look of the foliage's different surfaces. I'm working primarily with my number four brush. It's a sable, round, and my mixed greens. Now it's time to paint in the style. I'm going to start with a fairly strong Windsor red. And brush it in, carry it up. Work into Windsor yellow. And carry that up right to the tip. I'm going to carry some Windsor Yellow down back into the style. And I'm going to leave that alone. I'm going to let that bleed. I want it to intermingle with the Windsor Red. Next, some of that Quinacridone Magenta with the Cobalt Blue mixture. Right down here. Yeah. And I'm going to allow everything to just do its own thing. I do want to add a little bit of a red dot in that area. And work it down so it blends that way.
yellow okra at the tip. Cobalt and Windsor Yellow. Ultramarine, and I'm digging into the ultramarine there. That's what I want to get on my brush. See, that's the advantage of leaving globs of unmixed color, because you can go in and get the benefit of using that unmixed color to create darker values. I gradually work into areas that I like to darken, like you see me, and I dance around with my brush, not using the tip, believe it or not. It may look like I'm using the tip, but I'm not. I always hold my brush on a slight angle to avoid pressing the tip into the paper. The paper is abrasive and will blunt the tip of the sable paint brush, and the brush will no longer be able to be brought to a fine point. Now that this is completely dry, I'm going to cover it with masking and that will allow me then to easily wash in the petal that's behind it. This is nice. No need to use a paintbrush for an area like this. I'll put that aside now to dry before I resume painting. But I would like to show you how I keep the needle clean. In a separate bottle, I have Windex. I take off this cap with the needle and I bring it to the sink and I just rinse it out. Have it rinsed it out, place it on the bottle to flush out. There we go. See, there's quite a bit of uh, masking in there and that would definitely dry and clog the tip. So the only effective way is to squirt clean water or Windex through it and that, that'll clean it out. I always rinse off the cap that I seal this with too because it has an accumulation of masking in there that tends to dry and clump up like you see over here. There we go. I always store my masking material upside down. And every so often I gently go like that so it's mixed well. Now that all the masking is dried and this area is completely protected, I dampened the petal that's behind this and I'll begin to flow in my colors. The colors that I will be using for the petal, my Windsor Yellow, this is a mixture of cadmium scarlet and Windsor yellow. Then to create a darker area that you see as the petal moves towards the center, I'm going to add quinacridone magenta. And into the darker area of quinacridone magenta, I'll be adding a mixture of cobalt blue with quinacridone magenta to produce a darker purplish reddish bluish color. That is the mixture of cadmium scarlet and Windsor yellow. And I'm applying that mixture of cadmium scarlet and Windsor yellow, which produces a beautiful orange to the dampened petal section. Using a clean, dampened brush to create the highlight on this side. 
And I would like to go back into what I see as a darker area right over here. Pull that into the dampened area. And the key is don't blend on the paper. Allow all blending to occur naturally through the intermixing of watercolor on its own. Some quinacridone magenta. The orange that I just applied is still very wet, and now I'm flowing in quinacridone magenta. Into the quinacridone magenta, I'm adding the deeper violet color that you see in the center of the flower. Try to follow the direction of the veins that I see in the petal. I don't blend the color with my brush. I drag the color across quickly. I let it bleed on its own. I'm gonna permit this to start to dry just a little bit. And when it hits the right moisture level, then I'm gonna splatter a little bit of water into it to cause that motley look on the surface. Meanwhile, let's go over here. This part of the leaf is slightly darker than the surrounding area. I'm going to take my cobalt blue and Windsor yellow and work it in. We're just about at the right moisture content for this, so I'll dip my brush into some water. Shake off the excess amount of water, then splatter and leave it. I'll add some additional blades of grass. The good color is the cobalt blue in Windsor yellow. Yeah, this diagonal thrust that enters the composition with a slightly darker top part. Leave it alone. And there's a lot of leaf activity going on down here that I didn't draw in. I have a, a leaf. It comes across like this. And then there's a vein here. Some veins that radiate out like that. Compositionally, these additional leaves are important. They're necessary visual elements that sort of reinforce the structure of the overall composition in this area. A leaf that comes up and goes down and just gets lost in the mess of leaves. Okay, I'll take my kneaded eraser, now that I've done all that, just lightly go over my line work, not to erase it, to lighten it up and break it up a bit. I'll continue to develop these newly added leaves using the same techniques that you have already watched me demonstrate. Notice how I sometimes I mop the paint in and with the tip of my brush I define the outer edge of my shape. This leaf seems to go into a shadow. I'm going to use straight cobalt blue to create a little bit of that shadow. Now pull it in with a slightly dampened brush and let it dry. Now I'm going to begin to transform this bluish area into a droplet. In the photo, I see it's, it's picking up an edge of dark green. So I'll begin to work that in. This is where I do use the tip because I need to get a relatively fine pointed line and there really isn't any other way to do that. The water droplets usually have bright highlights in them in addition to the sharp lines. Now I'm picking up a light wash of mixed green and I'll apply it to this water droplet. Have to let that dry now. In all areas, I usually work to establish contrasts.
return into this droplet. The line is sharp here and soft here. Plain water, damp in this area where it kind of merges into the darkness. Get some fairly strong color, but I'm going to place that deeper green into the dampened area so it will bleed. I also will add a little bit of yellow to enrich the area. Water droplets enhance the color saturation, sometimes, unless they're creating glares, but often they'll enhance the color saturation and make the colors underneath more vivid. And that's something I want to do here. I'm going to carry it into this area. I need to continue. But right now, I can't do much of anything, so I'm going to let it dry. Quite a bit of work remains to be done. I need to continue developing some of the leaves and playing with the shadows by washing in blues to push them further into the shadow area. But more importantly, the veins have to be introduced here. I want to show you how to create some water droplets on here, including this big one right in the center. And the burst of grass back here, that's going to simply be suggested. It's not going to be rendered like I did over here. I laid these in much more precisely. And before I start to apply my washes back here to create the grass and all the other stuff that's going on, I think I'm going to do some masking. I'm going to mask out this basic shape so I don't have to worry about getting paint on it. See how I can apply a nice bead of masking around a shape to form a protective barrier. Now watch this. This is very interesting. I'm going to lay this in in multiple layers. And what it will do is give me a very effective border that will help prevent paint from running into that area. I have to let this application of masking dry. Then I'll apply a second layer to build it up. The question I often get in class when I do this is, will that remove the paint underneath? The answer is, it does have a tendency to remove a small amount of pigment, but not enough to really bother me. Notice though, I'm not brushing. Brushing would, would actually contribute to more pigment loss. You would be moving the paint around on the, underneath the wet masking with the possibility of lifting it up. So when you think of applying masking, think of flowing it on with lots of wet masking fluid. Once it's dry, I could apply a second bead. The purpose of this is to create a slight elevation of masking that will form a protective barrier against large wet washes of color. While waiting for the masking to completely dry, I'm going to continue to develop that little bead of water over here. I'll dampen the area. Then I go into my darker green, which is a mixture of ultramarine blue and Windsor yellow. Get a fair amount of strong pigment. And I paint in that line. Now the area was a little drier than I like. So with a damp brush, I go back into it. Just dancing around, adding green where I need to add it. Picking up my darkest green. I'm going to begin to wash that in.
and I see some lighter greens that poke through. I search for variations in colors and I lay them in. Wet into wet. So they bleed nicely into one another, creating beautiful abstract watercolor effects. I see yellow ochre, so I'm going to throw some of that in. I'm placing color and letting it bleed. I'd like to throw in some dark ultramarine blue. Now I have enough confidence that the watercolor knows what to do. So I'm going to leave it alone. I actually see quite a bit of cerulean here too. So I'm going to dampen it with a little bit of cerulean, watered down cerulean. Into that, I'm going to work my greens. I get the feeling that there's a little bit of a bluish highlight going on there. So I'll apply the lighter green like that and allow some of the blue to poke through. I'm going to go into the darker Winsy Yellow with Ultramarine Blue. I painted this water droplet in. And I'm absolutely not happy with it. What happened is there was a very dark area in the petal that the outer edge of the droplet merged with, resulted in a distorted look. So I'm going to do some corrective painting here. I'm going to lift out the color in this area and redefine the shape of this glob of water that's going to be here. Sometimes things just don't work out. I'm going to use an acrylic paintbrush, it's slightly stiffer than my watercolor paintbrushes. And I'm dampening it with a little water. So the first thing I'm gonna do, you have reached the end of part two on how to paint the orange hibiscus flower. Please watch part three for the continuation and conclusion of this watercolor painting series. Thanks for watching part two of the series.